Well, it's Saturday, 10th of April. This is the state of the vehicles in at the moment. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, a bit rough. There's only half a number plate at the front, but that's the least of its problems. We've actually got some uh, new number plates for it, but uh, probably won't be fitting those for a while yet. The next step is to actually get the vehicle over to Trent, to Sutton on Trent, to get the underside shot blasted. It's almost roadworthy uh, for that, that, that trip, although it would be a bit interesting. As you can see, there's an indicator missing at the front. We're going to have to rig something up. The windscreen wipers don't work. We'll probably wing that. Um, the lights at the back are a bit iffy, so we'll have to repair those. Um, I think most of the things that we're about to drop off, they have been secured for the journey here to the barn, so we're in reasonable shape for actually driving it probably some 10-15 miles over to Sutton on Trent for the shot plastic. The engine, back to the vehicle itself, is running very well, as uh, you may, may have heard on an earlier piece. The engine is a six-cylinder petrol, and it sounds beautifully smooth. Uh, it's reluctant to start initially, but once it's been started for the day, it's usually pretty good. Um, but it's it's a finicky beast to start from cold, um, but it's beautiful when it's actually running so smooth. It was the BBC who had been told by the army that if they were going to run large vehicles around with lots of electronic gear uh, comprised of valves, that they really ought to have petrol engines. So for many, many years the BBC insisted on petrol engines in their vehicle rather than bouncy diesels, but it was later proved that diesels actually weren't a problem. The tyres on this vehicle uh, were very hard to get and uh, currently probably one of the best bits on the vehicle. The tyres are all brand new and they're actually proper Dunlop ones, so uh, there's no expense spared. We were very lucky to be able to get those because it's a, a pretty rare size and uh, a fella pitied them last year and they uh, really do Look, look the part and it's a, I say, about the best bit on the vehicle so far but hopefully the rest of it will be completed to uh, a similar sort of standard. Behind this cover here was the aircon unit and these covers here were the actual mains determination from, from the outside world, the mains supply and also external mains feeds for feeding uh, on-site equipment. Um, and on this side is the rear door and then you'll see these little gaps here these should have chrome footsteps, pull-out footsteps in them, so that you can actually climb up the back and get to the ladder up at the top to gain access to the roof. They're missing. They are available, but they're just very expensive. <laughs> right, there's the, the scrap pile here is actually very valuable. It's got some uh, Marconi Mark III heads on here. They're not the best examples of Marconi Mark III's in the world by any stretch of the imagination. A couple at the back are a bit better. They're certainly uh, valuable spare sources. The three I'm going to use for this project are, are back at base. Uh, but what it does have in here, uh, which are absolutely vital, is the camera control positions. These rather large steel uh, items. There's two actually uh, roughly in position, and there's a third one here. At the back, all piled up there, is some large plates. They look like scrap metal, they're not. They are the anti-vibration mountings for all the equipment that will be racked up uh, in midships in the vehicle. And the rest of the equipment at the back there is sort of uh, camera control, picture monitors, um, and also uh, power supplies. Uh, above us is some uh, a problem awaiting solution, which is two holes where two large 12-inch fans should be. Those fans are still available, exactly the same pattern as from the 1950s, but unfortunately they are £650 plus VAT each, so uh, it's solvable given enough money. Uh, moving on down the bus, as it were, uh, come to the, uh, the driver's room, uh, the driving position, which also needs some large amount of work. Um, but the controls essentially function, but they're not very pretty. It suffered some vandalism from school children at one point in its history, and uh, that has to be repaired. Broken speedo glass and relatively trivial things like that. Uh, there's also a lot of paint spillage. The seats, are, well, the driver's seat in particular, is needs refurbishment. The passenger seat, a bit of refurbishment, not too bad. The, the driver and passengers actually sit on top of the engine, so underneath there is the big six-cylinder inline petrol engine. Um, above the driver are more small storage cupboards, um, so those need some refurbishment, getting all the paint off them, and there's a couple of, there's a door missing, and 
think we've got to source some of this um, laminated um, uh, fibre laminated board. Some of the vehicle internal fittings survive quite nicely. The lighting uh, is absolutely original from uh, the original fit. There's also uh, some little tables which fold out from the side of the vehicle. Uh, they're still present. Things like air conditioning controls and light switches, they're all missing. Um, but one nice feature which survives is the very stylish pegboard, which is this uh, laminated uh, hardboard with a series of holes drilled at one inch pitch, which was used throughout sort of studios all over the world. Right, in this jar are all the components that I've so far removed from making this monitor work again. Um, there's a kind of capacitor, a Dabelia, which is uh, common throughout this Marconi Mark III series of equipment and a lot of other equipment, including domestic television sets of the period. And at the age of nearly 60 years old, they're just time expired. They leak like sieves. So it, this monitor, everywhere there's a yellow one, the yellow item on here, it's been replaced. And here is the jar full of bits.